is the Richard Perillo Family Professor of Healthcare Ethics in the Department of Medicine and the Director of the Chicago Center for Diabetes Translation Research at the University of Chicago. He's also a practicing general internist and a national, I would say international, expert in improving diabetes care for vulnerable patients and reducing racial and ethnic disparities in healthcare. Dr. Chen serves as the Associate Chief and Director of Research in the Section of General Medicine. He's an Associate Director for the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and is a co-director of the John A. Hartford Foundation Center of Excellence in Geriatrics. Um, I'm just extremely thrilled and honored to be able to introduce Marshall. Can I come up? Yeah, thank you, Monica. So I'm going to talk about what I think is one of the two cutting edge issues in health disparities. Pay one is payment reform to reduce health care disparities. And what I won't talk, spend too much time talking about is the, the second cutting edge issue, which I think is what Monica mentioned, intersectoral health, basically bridging the health and non-health care sectors to reduce disparities. So for disclosures, I have a variety of government and private foundation funding. The closest to a for-profit is the Merck Foundation, is a foundation uh, funded by Merck Company. And then the other potential conflicts, I do a lot of uh, uh, committee and policy work for a variety of different national organizations. Uh, some of the specialty organizations, the safety organizations, consumer groups, uh, governmental groups, including Medicare, and I co-chair the National Quality Forum Disparity Standing Committee. Uh, I'm also active in the, the leadership and advocacy of our major professional society for general internists, Society of General Internal Medicine. So our, our learning objectives are first to recognize key trends and policies in the private marketplace and government reimbursement policy impacting disparities, and then to identify opportunities to improve equity. I'm going to start with two case vignettes, give a brief history of health disparities, talk a little bit about cure transformation to reduce disparities, give a whirlwind tour of payment policy from the 60s to the present, then discuss payment reform to achieve equity, and then end with some early impressions from innovators in this area of payment reform to reduce disparities. So this is from maybe eight or nine years ago that um, at that time, there was a, the chief financial officer of the University of Chicago who had been in this job for a long time. I think it was like 15, 18 years or so. And each year, he would go to each of the different departments and give his basically state of the finances talk about the medical center. And uh, basically, he, he said the same thing every year where um, the reality is that the, what brings in the money is quaternary care to the university. It turns out it's only 5% of the patients at the University of Chicago that bring in the money that reimburses the rest of the operations. And so it's uh, organ transplantation, orthopedic surgery, cancer chemotherapy, gastrointestinal procedures, There's relatively few uh, uh, of the different, different uh, elements of the uh, uh, organization. And so maybe the third time I heard him give this talk, I raised my hand and said, um, now isn't it a little risky uh, basing the organization's strategic plan on only 5% of the patients? Because basically the organization's plan was basically how do you increase the flow of these types of patients to the University of Chicago? And he said to me, well, Marshall, you know, smart aleck, um, someone asks me this question every year. And my answer is always the same. What has changed in the marketplace or healthcare policy that would make me change the strategic plan? And I had to basically shut up at that point that eight or nine years ago, he, he was right. That, uh, that, that it made a lot of sense in terms of the university's doing what is playing by the rules of the game. And this is what would bring in the money. Second story, so Monica mentioned the Southside Diabetes Project. And uh, one of the things that uh, it involves is working with six different clinics in the south side of Chicago. And this is one of them on the right side, Chicago Family Health Center. Excellent, fairly qualified health center, uh, very mission driven, uh, really good people. And so we would check on them every, every few uh, uh, months. And um, at this particular meeting where the medical, uh, chief medical officer was there, um, he basically said, well, you know, we love the program, we love the way that we're trying to transform care, but we have our limits. And he said that, well, because of the way we're paid, there's only only so much we can do to make what we think are, would be the logical type of changes that would help reduce disparities. So I'll say that it's not just the University of Chicago, it's even some of the most mission-driven, fairly qualified health centers that were in the same boat. So there are different definitions of disparities. The one I'm going to use for this talk is the one for the Institute of Medicine. Differences in the quality of health care that are not due to access-related factors or the clinical needs, preferences of patients or the appropriateness of interventions. 
Well, that's a lot sort of that's bundled in that definition. So I'm going to show it to you here graphically. This was one of, one of Monica's slides that she was going to show. The vertical axis is the quality of health care. The big white bar is a non-minority population, say a white population. The lower, uh, darker bar is a minority population, say African American population. The difference is the difference in the quality of care divided into three different aspects. The first box is what's thought to be perhaps okay. So if there's a clinically appropriate reason for the difference in care or patient preference issue. The latter two boxes are the ones which are problematic, so-called disparities. The middle box being the way we set up, the way we organize care and pay for care. And the third box is various forms of discrimination or implicit biases. I'm going to be concentrating upon most of the second box here in this talk. So quick history of health disparities. Uh, so it's relatively new in terms of the national consciousness. So this is uh, 1985, 31 years ago, Margaret Heckler, Secretary of Health and Human Services in President Reagan's administration, uh, this report, Black and Minority Health, the first federal report showing disparities in the country. So the old timers here will remember this article from Kevin Shulman, New England Journal of Medicine, 1999, that was entitled The Effect of Race and Sex on Physicians' Recommendations for Cardiac Catheterization. This is a vignette study where it basically had a, a patient that had clinical indications for heading cardiac catheterization. So the patient should have received cardiac catheterization. Randomized vignette study where the only things that differed in the, the randomized vignettes were uh, the gender of the patient and then the race of the patient. You see the actual uh, photos used in the vignettes. And, and what it showed was that um, there's disparities, so that even though all these patients should have been referred to cardiac catheterization, in particular, if you were a black woman, uh, you had the greatest uh, under uh, referral then for cardiac catheterization. So this is the study that perhaps made the most impact in terms of the public, because it sort of was people can grasp it, that it is sort of an overt discrimination or implicit bias in this particular case. Monica mentioned 2002, the Institute of Medicine Unequal Treatment Report, giving a lot of visibility to this. And then all I would say at this point is that up until like maybe 10 years ago, most of what academia did was document disparities, so endless studies document disparities, and a lot of studies showing what the cause of disparities, very little on solutions. So we were forced at the University of Chicago about 12 years ago to become a national program office of one of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation's major disparities programs, Finding Answers to Disparities for Change. And about three, four years ago, we published this article that we call our Roadmap article that ended up getting um, a lot of, uh, of a play. Uh, it was cited in a recent National Academy of Medicine report on best practices for basic disparities, and it's cited in the Medicare's uh, equity plan. Uh, and so and it's, uh, I think it's become like, um, common acceptance that this is the type of approach that makes sense for transforming care. And it basically devolves down to three principles. First, there's no simple magic bullet. And then second, it requires a systematic process, and this is one of the reasons why it's hard and it's not a magic bullet. A systematic process that involves numerous steps, including awareness and prioritization of achieving equity by both individuals as well as institutions like the university. Tailoring of solutions to the local, organizational, and patient context. An iterative quality improvement process. That you're not going to get the solution right the first time. You've got to keep on adapting and trying again. And addressing the specific barriers of facilities to change. And then some issue of implementation science. How do you get things to work in the real world? At the same time, though, if you just say, well, here's a process, uh, go ahead and do it, people don't like that. And so there is a menu of evidence-based interventions that organizations and providers can use as a start, but that will have to tailor to their own particular setting. So it's a fair amount we know it, actually, now in terms of reducing disparities. So some model slide addition that just reminds us that um, there are multiple targets then for interventions, the, the community, uh, the patient, the provider, the healthcare organization. I want to talk about the top part, which is the policy lever, in particular financing, which is perhaps like the potentially one of the most powerful levers that is not really being used right now. So payment reform from uh, Lyndon Johnson to the president with President Obama. So in 1965, Medicare being passed, and uh, the AMA was initially against uh, this, and the concern was basically uh, depression of physician fees. So language was built in that Medicare had to pay the usual, customary, reasonable fees so that the that, uh, physicians would, uh, uh, from the AMA's perspective, not be under-reimbursed. If you fast forward to the 1980s, uh, in, in 1989, uh, what was passed was the resource-based relative value scale. And what that was was a physician payment scale that was built upon research that tried to 
to figure out what was the amount of work that was required to do something like a colonoscopy, to do something like a geriatric visit, uh, and was sort of then payment was based upon that. Um, it's actually one of the major problems right now in payment reform because it basically uh, highly over um, reimburses specialists at the expense of the cognitive sciences, like a geriatrician, for example. And politically, one of the reasons is that it's run by what's called the AMA Resource-Based uh, resource Relative Value Scale Update Committee, of which I think like 22 out of 24 people are specialists, and so um, there's a lot of conflicts of interest there. 1997, the Medicare Sustainable Growth Rate uh, uh, Act was passed, which said that physician payment could not exceed the growth in the, in the gross uh, domestic product. The people were afraid about the Medicare budget uh, ballooning. Uh, the rubber hit the road in 2002 when, uh, because this act, if it was followed, physician uh, reimbursement would be cut by 5%. Then there was a lot of concern then that if, if physician's payment was cut, people would, physicians would leave the Medicaid, Medicare program and that uh, there would be access problems. So the su succeeding 12 years then, Congress then passed a variety of so-called doc fixes where basically they overruled uh, that, that particular uh, uh, rule. Um, and then this basically would happen again and again and again. And then Last year, this sustainable growth rate was repealed. And you're going to hear more about, more about this in the policy envi environment, but something called MACRA was passed that re re replaced the SGR. So we'll go talk more about macro in a moment, but what happened though is that this is basically the shift from paying for volume to so-called value-based payment. So the current Secretary of Health and Human Services, Sylvia Burwell, uh, 2015 NEGIM uh, editorial, uh, she talked about like the two different sort of forms of delivery. So this Medicare fee for service, payment by volume. So by this year, paying, uh, tying 85% of that payment to quality measures or value measures as opposed to purely paying based upon just having it done by 2018, 90%. Then the second uh, bullet here is then all turn to payment models. We're hearing about things like accountable care organizations, bundle payments, basically various forms of, of um, putting payment into a global uh, amount, uh, then, and, and the, the money comes from that. But under these systems, the providers being accountable, again, for the quality and now the cost of care. By this year, the goal was to have 30% of Medicare payment through these alternative payment models. By 2018, 50%. So the sh gradual shift we're seeing. Uh, this is a funny story that um, I had this sort of chance meeting with uh, Secretary Burwell, just, just by chance. And so it's one of these situations where you had, I had like 30 seconds to make a pitch, uh, just uh, in terms of uh, basically seeing her. And so basically the pitch I made was that you got to basically explicitly use your payment reimbursement mechanisms to explicitly try to reduce disparities. So that was my 30 second message to her. Um, so MACRA, uh, it's an acronym for the Medicare Access and SHIP Reauthorization Act. So again, it eliminates this SGR. There's a 0.5% annual rate of increase in physician payment through 2019. 2019, it becomes live. Something called the quality payment programs, where all physicians and organizations need to choose one of two pathways. Something called MIPS, the Merit-Based Incentive Payment System, and the second called Advanced Alternative Payment Models. What's MIPS? Well, a physician's reimbursement can either grow by up to 4% or decline by up to 4% based upon these measures, these basic quality measures, composed of four different elements, which are the latter four bullets here. 60% of the calculation is based upon uh, your report performance on six quality measures that you report. 15% will be based upon your quality improvement, clinical improvement activities. 25% will be based upon your use of electronic health records. There's five different measures for that. Note that at present, 0% is allocated to how uh, cost efficient you are. By 2021, 30% of the formula will be based upon the cost and resources. Advanced alternative payment models this is the other pathway. So the advantage for this is that on, off the top, you get an automatic 5% additional bonus payment to incentivize people or physicians to go into this particular pathway. You have to use a certified electronic health record. Payment is based upon quality measures. And then, as we mentioned before, the provider needs to bear more than a nominal amount of financial risk. So this idea about the global payments, so ACOs, patient and medical homes, episode-based payments. So I've just spent about five minutes talking about some of these arcane details of payment policy, which I think are going to be important to realize. But you may have noticed that um, where's equity? And that's the problem, that uh, basically it hasn't been anything I've mentioned in terms of these major directions that uh, Medicare and the payers are going into at this point in time. 
So there's this issue of motivation. And so that, um, especially for McLean audience, you know, I think we talk a lot about professionalism and uh, um, doing the right thing and having moral values. Um, Extrinsic motivators are also powerful, though. So money can be a powerful motivator, and non-monetary financial or rewards also. So we had another sort of major piece come out uh, this year, um, creating the business case for achieving health equity, which again has already started to achieve a lot of traction. National Academy of Medicine um, cites it in that report. There was an equity leadership forum sponsored by the American Hospital Association and Joint Commission, which talked about the six principles of Glover. Families USA, major consumer advocacy group, is adopting these principles, as well as the National Quality Forum. So there's six different aspects that we're basically arguing for in terms of things that um, this was going to be probably more likely uh, if there was a uh, Clinton uh, presidency, uh, but uh, those have to be introduced and sort of pushed for for uh, under the uh, President Trump's uh, presidency. So first, requiring public reporting of stratified disparities data. So in other words, reporting performance of quality data stratified by race or ethnicity or insurance status, for example. Uh, once people see the light, sometimes it's like a sanitizer, that when people see the data, people are motivated then to take action. Strengthening incentives for prevention and primary care. I mean, right now the money is in coordinary care, uh, so that there need to be stronger incentives than for prevention and primary care. Most of the current global payment systems right now, like the current ACO systems, actually the amount of uh, money at risk is relatively small, so that the, the at-risk amount probably needs to be increased to basically create the, the stronger incentives for investing in infrastructure for preventive care. Um, we talked about um, uh, the RVU problem in terms of the payment schedule uh, being way weighted towards proceduralists, and we talked about encouraging intersectoral partnerships. Uh, the third one is one I just don't know why it's not being done already, which is pay for reducing disparities. Uh, right now, there is the so-called uh, rising tide lifts all boats uh, a perspective that if you, if you improve quality in general, just you, you do some type of general quality improvement initiative, the assumption is that it's going to help everyone. Whereas um, there's increasing evidence that you basically have to tailor to the specific needs of different populations, different individuals. And so besides rewarding for overall quality, why not reward for reducing disparities? Aligning these uh, quality measures across public and private payers so that uh, if, if uh, all the payers of a place like University of Chicago have the same metrics, then we're more motivated to basically meet them. And then taking care of the safety net providers. And something that I think Monica sort of alluded to, that um, there's a relatively small number of the hospitals and providers that take care for the majority of the at-risk patients. And so they're going to need to have special help, adequate payment. Um, um, Right now, there was something called DISH, Disproportionate Share Hospitals, that was greatly reduced when uh, the Obama Act was passed. Uh, the problem was that it was assumed that increased insurance expansion would then uh, compensate for that. But because so many different uh, red states did not expand, those states are being killed. Uh, risk adjustment to create a level playing field, so adjusting, for example, for the social factors involved of, uh, that are part of a patient. Uh, so, you, so actually, Dean Polanski makes this point that um, and actually, that was his major suggestion when I showed him a draft of this um, paper, that um, you, uh, a place in Yerushaga would be penalized because of like, the high number of Medicare, Medicaid patients we take care of, unless there was risk adjustment to um, um, better create a level playing field. So uh, uh, places like Yerushaga have more incentive to care for Medicaid patients, demo projects. But the main point is having an explicit equity lens of so thinking about up front how we design our payment and care systems so that we reduce disparities. So we, our idea of the program has morphed into one that now looks at payment and delivery system reform. So we're giving out grants and, and evaluating this. Most of our grantees do a combination of paper performance and some type of global payment scheme. I want to uh, share now this for the last couple of minutes now. Uh, so some of the, these are some of the research questions that are the cutting edge. So you know, what are the best payment models to achieve equity? How do you optimize intrinsic and extrinsic motivation? How do you overcome payment reform implementation barriers? And I'm going to share some quotes from some of our current grantees that sort of crystallize some of these issues. So about intrinsic motivation, one organization says, I think even if it was presented as goals only, no financial attachment, I think just the fact that we are certain things that we need to meet, I think that's a push enough for everyone. So, you know, it's professionalism. Uh, one payer says money helps. Just like with everything else, what gets monitored gets done. So yeah, I mean, they should be doing it, but having that additional incentive, I think, does serve as a very good reminder. And the fact that it's sort of team-based, I think, makes it somewhat effective in linking the two, the behaviors, the incentive, and hopefully the positive outcomes. 
this issue of maybe it's not sort of money for the provider, but having a good infrastructure so we can deliver good care. So it's not about the financial incentive. It's about the non-financial incentive, right? It's about not only do you get to do the right thing, but that you have the resources to do that. And so we thought the primary part of the study was that is going to be most impactful was this extra resource and making it easier for clinicians to do the right thing. So for example, being able to hire community health workers or care managers. I think that the amount of money would cost to actually budge them, providers, if it was based on the financial, the financial interest, would be just too high. If you really want to change behaviors, then give them each a ton of money for each postpartum visit. I am sure they would do it, but that amount would be something that no one could afford. Coercion. But you know, at times we felt like we had been coerced, you know. If you don't do this, then you don't get it, okay? So there was that fine line, you know, incentive versus coercion and money. So difficult is just to sort out. Technical issues. So number one, does it get to the right person X? I don't know that. And number two, if it doesn't get to the right person, you know, what can we do? Or if it does get to the right person, how can we make sure that person pays attention to it and evaluates that opportunity for the practice so the money goes to the right person? And then who do you incentivize? And the challenge, I think, is making it meaningful to the individual providers when these incentives are paid at the practice level. Having the practices figure out how to tie those payments back to providers and how they want to organize their practices around that type of performance incentive. So a lot of unresolved issues. So I'll end then that uh, a couple of years ago I had an editorial in the uh, New England Journal of Medicine that was how to achieve health equity. Uh, and it devolved down to four things. Looking at your own data, if you have disparities in your practice, talking to your patients and tailoring care for them, align the incentives and assisting the safety net. And so I'll just end the University of Chicago. We're actually, since Dean Polanski came on board, uh, we've made a lot more progress. I think part of it is his background from South Africa where he saw apartheid and disparities up front. So I think part of it is sort of morally driven. But I'm not so naive to believe that uh, it's the full thing that's the driving the University of Chicago. And because now the environment has shifted than my initial story eight, nine years ago, where we now have, I think this fear, this fear that global payments and ACOs are coming. Actually, we'll be entering our first ACO contracts, I think in 2017. Um, more at-risk contracts, population health has become more important, pay for performance, the community needs assessments required for a nonprofit like the University of Chicago to maintain its nonprofit tax status. There's now financial incentives to start looking at disparities. The last slide here, I uh, have like the leadership of our, our center here. So I ended this uh, needs to trail by saying that leadership matters. It is a professional responsibility as clinicians, administrators, and policymakers to improve the way we deliver care to the diverse patients. We can do better. And I think as Monica eloquently said at the end of her talk that uh, this is going to be an environment where we all need to basically uh, make sure that advocacy is a priority and that we work on these concrete ways that we can help improve the way we deliver and pay for care. Thank you very much. We have time for a few questions. I see a few people making their way to the mic. And then, Lamont, did you have a question? Okay. Can I ask a question? I'm wondering if there will be any policy in place for reimbursement with a harm reduction framework. I work with patients who drink up to six two liter bottles of soda a day and smoke five to six packs of cigarettes. When we get them down to a pack a day or one liter of soda every other day, we get the hemoglobin A1C down to eight from 14. Those are achievements, but from the goals that the government has, we're still not succeeding with the numbers. So I'm wondering if there's a voice for people that um, have a different lifestyle than most of us in the room. Because a lot of the numbers are wonderful, but um, really it's about a harm reduction model, right? That is the success. 
Yeah, there, there are a couple potential areas that, that can come into play. One is that the more that there are these global contracts, then people are looking at the, the so-called high utilizers, the high cost patients. And so some of, of, of the folks that are like the multiple comorbidity patients that be, maybe substance abuse, behavioral health, uh, frequent uh, visits to the emergency department, these are the folks that uh, places like Universal are starting to design systems to basically pour more resources into trying to keep people healthy and not in the emergency department in the hospital. The second uh, strand is that uh, there are some uh, thoughts about can you give more reimbursement to the care that is evidence-based. So uh, if there's evidence-based uh, practices for harm reduction uh, in terms of like uh, mental health treatment, for example, or substance abuse treatment, or outcomes-based in terms of um, rewarding if you're able to uh, have the end results of people with better uh, risk factor control. Um, so those are the potential two different strands that may help with what you're talking about. What you talked about is is AX. Okay, so it's back on. Did you did you hear the beginning of the question? Ah. So it's interesting that the Institute of Medicine uh, takes access out of the disparities equation, but it looks like um, that you put it back in, which I think is probably important. Um, do you really think that um, incentivizing people not to um, not to practice disparate medicine is the way to go um, with this? Um, because it seems <laughs> that incentivizing something like that uh, sort of is, it goes against sort of the moral sort of fiber of doctors taking care of patients. And I, and I think this whole move towards incentivizing things is, is really a move away from sort of um, practicing ethical medicine. <laughs> Yeah. A couple points. Thanks, Dan, for those comments. Uh, so first, in 2010, the IOM um, revised their definition of quality of care. So, uh, so um, access is now one of the dimensions of quality of care. Uh, so um, that has been elevated to a more prominent uh, uh, in the IOM's overall view of, of quality of care. You know, I think in terms of this issue of like the balance of uh, professionalism, uh, individual incentives to physicians, and then resources to reduce disparities, there's got to be a balance. And, and I feel like my, my quotes I gave at the very end showed that um, it, it'd be simplistic and, and wrong to basically try to emphasize one over the other. So for example, at this core, it's got to be professionalism, that uh, um, there's just so many things that are involved in delivering great care to patients that it has to be driven by uh, doing the right thing for patients. But at the same time, um, at the margin, uh, it, it probably makes a difference. So for example, like one of our grantees is, in, um, is incentivizing teams, so not just the physician, but like the, the nurse and the front office person and all, and um, you know some of the early evidence seems to be showing that, well, for things that then require the whole team, um, um, then that can make a difference at, at the margin. And then the overall institution, you're going to have to sort of make it so that um, it makes sense for like a, a big battleship like the University of Chicago to work on equity. So there's only so much that goodwill and the overall ideals of the university can go if the famous system is stacked against uh, putting a lot of resources into equity. So it's going to require all three of those things, I think. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. All right.